that probably disco was the first genre that broke out not on the radio. You know, I mean, it began to break out in the clubs and the guys at on, you know, who were working, you know, the radio jocks and the guys doing promotions at the record company, the record companies, they were like completely caught off guard. I mean, like when Eddie Kendricks's girl, you need a change of mind began to get club play. They didn't understand it and they didn't know it. You know, Barry White's the big first disco hit, Barry White's hit that was sitting in a, a bin of uh, records that were basically due to be trashed at Barry White's, I think it was 20th That's right. Century. That's right. Re- yeah, it was 20th Century. Record company. Yeah. And it was spied by a couple of DJs that were that were there paying a visit, and they started to play it at their clubs, and it it got popular. And so then radio was forced to play it. Um, but initially, you know, radio had no idea that this scene was happening or that it would blow up the way that it did. I mean, I don't think anybody knew that. And the thing is, like, uh, from from my own viewpoint, having been, like, seven years old in 1977, we just did a show. We, well, we tried to do a, a show on 77 last night, but it did turn into something crazy. So we're going to try to savage that <laughs> in the edit. But uh, Saturday Night Fever, in many ways, brought disco into the mainstream culture, and it kind of broke it in a way that allowed for its o- almost over overexposure and, and, and eventual mm-hmm. bas- bastardization. Mm-hmm. And it, it's amazing how, as you're a kid... And again, I'm just speaking from my own experience mm-hmm. that if you're seven years old, seven and eight years old in 77 and 78, and you have no real sense of a, of a timeline yet, uh, how Saturday Night Fever seemed to be the beginning of a movement. But in reality, mm-hmm. it's, it's, it's kind of like it really came along after the fact yeah. where it was something yeah. that, you know, it, in, its, in its purest form had already passed. Yeah, it's really, and you know, the executives who were working on that, I mean, uh, the film company, they were like, the studio, they were like, <laughs> they kept trying to speed up the release because they were convinced that disco was going to crash, that it was, you know. <laughs> really? That, you know, that they would, oh yeah, that they would miss it, you know. And so they were really eager to have that come out as early as possible. I mean, they were really racing and... Um, at least according to what I've read. Yeah. And and, and then, was... you, know, you know, Saturday Night Fever does change things. I mean, you're absolutely right. And I quote some people in the book who talk about how people, in, especially in, in more mainstream clubs, started to dance like, or trying to dance like the people in Fever. Um, <laughs> but it's, it, it, is, it is just fascinating. I mean, I would love if, I mean, Saturday Night Fever, of course, it's based upon a completely, it's not based upon observation of those disco clubs. It was a story that was written by um, a British writer. Is it a New Yorker who magazine, took, I think? Yep. Yeah, who published the story in New York Magazine, and it got bought up by Stigwood, Robert Stigwood, and made into a movie. But he really, his... Uh, his source material were was was really his own experiences as a sort of observing mod culture in Britain quite a few years earlier. <laughs> so, Go figure. You know, yeah. I mean, so we didn't. So I mean, it is true. So I mean, Tony Monero and his friends—they're you know ethnic. You know, they're Italian Americans um, living in Brooklyn, um, and. And they're working class. And you so think, it, you it, think Saturday you know, Night Fever would have really worked? It is really interesting. And I think that there were, for sure, working class people who listened and danced to disco. We just don't have that history yet. Do you think to- Saturday Night Fever would have worked if Tony were gay? No. Yeah. It was, uh, no. It, yeah. Because it already, you know, if you look at some of the criticism that came out, it was clear that there were already ways in which the fact that he danced the way that he did, you know, there's that one curious scene where the camera sort of lingers on his body and on him in bed. And 
I think that there were people for whom, even though the Tony character is undeniably heterosexual, I think that there were people who found him, I mean, there were people who made fun of him as um, not fully heterosexual. Right. Um, so, yeah, rock I don't fans. think it would have worked at all. I mean, people think about with it. People with a rock-centric no... mentality in 1978 were the ones that were saying that. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I just don't think it. I don't think it would have worked. I mean, um, think of how long it's taken. I mean, it really wasn't until the '90s that that began to to really shift. Yeah. So I think that there was a real utility in having it be a white heterosexual guy um, it's, it's and making that, disco safe. Yeah. It's funny that you said how they were trying to rush the movie out by the end of '77. You know, the the movie's released in December, in Mm mid-December, and, you know, How Deep Is Your Love is already the number one song. It was was released as a single, I I think, in late October, Mm -hmm. early November, and it it, it Mm -hmm. already climbed the charts by the time Mm -hmm. the movie was released, which was... Which was, I, I mean, you don't see that happening too much, and uh, you know, with the fear that okay, disco is going to die, quick, get this out quick. Uh, you know, there were never so many pop, so many disco songs on the pop charts than in '78, in '79. Yeah. You know, following yeah. Saturday Night Fever. 